It's my distinct pleasure to be able to introduce Dr. Gene Allen Smith. Uh, Gene Smith is professor of history at Texas Christian University, Fort Worth. He is author or editor of seven books and numerous articles and reviews on early American history and American naval and maritime history. Ugh. He also serves as director of the Center for Texas Studies at TCU and since April 2008 as curator of history at the Fort Worth Museum of Science and History. Uh, his talk of his title this morning is Thomas Jefferson, Manifest Destiny and the Texas Revolution. Please help me welcoming Dr. Smith. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here today. This is, I need something a little taller. Uh, it's, my mom always told me I should be the first one to speak in the room. That way, if I uh, said something that was out of place, there'd be a chance for others to follow up and correct me. So hopefully I can get started today and I'll say a few things that you might think, well, God, that seems out of place. But fortunately, the land commissioner has already told you uh, many of the fireworks of my presentation, uh, because it's really about Texas before it became Anglo, and how certain people wanted it to become Anglo. Now, one of the things I can tell you is that I'm an early American historian, and I work on the era of Thomas Jefferson, and you may say that Thomas Jefferson really has no association whatsoever with Texas. Well, that's not exactly correct. I mean, he does have an association with Texas. In fact, what we see is that he has a vision. And this vision he had was what he called an empire of liberty. And certainly Texas embodies that empire of liberty. It was a vision that will provide the framework for manifest destiny. It'll provide the framework for the Texas Revolution. And it's really going to lay the foundation for what becomes a continental empire. It stretches from the Atlantic to the Pacific. Now, because of that, Jefferson believed that Tejas, that that was a cornerstone in what he saw as American expansion. Now, for someone who studies Thomas Jefferson, one thing I can tell you is that in, this is in a day and age before Twitter and before Facebook and he wrote more than 20,000 letters. And the thing that kills me is how politicians from the right and from the left are quick to cherry pick his quotes and try to say that Jefferson supported this or Jefferson supported that. Well, yeah, he did support this and that. And you figure he lived to be 80 plus years old. So over the course of a long life, he did have a lot of different attitudes. And his, his ideas and beliefs were always evolving and changing. Well, in 1786, Jefferson would write to a friend, he said, our continent must be viewed as the nest from which all America, north and south, is to be peopled. Well, in 1791, the summer of 1791, the Spanish governor of Florida, Quesada, you said there was a pointer on this thing. Pointer, pointer, pointer. Yeah, is it? A, yeah. Okay. You take. Fortunately, you guys know where Florida is. <laughs> <laughs> but the Spanish governor of Florida, uh, Governor Quesada, he extended an invitation for Americans to move into Florida. All they would need to do is take an oath of loyalty to the Spanish government. They would profess to be Catholics and they could acquire all the land they wanted. Well, Jefferson thought this was a great idea. In fact, he said he wished 100,000 Americans would move there because it would give us peaceably what might otherwise cost us a war. Now, what Jefferson is telling us there is here is his vision for how Americans would incorporate territory. They would be invited in. They would profess loyalty to that government. They would embrace that government's Christian faith. And then in due time, their American loyalties and emotions would bubble to the top. And at that point, 
they would welcome the opportunity to join the constellation of stars and stripes. Keep that in mind. That's a framework. That's a, a modus operandi that Jefferson envisioned for America. In 1801, Jefferson mentioned in his first inaugural address that the United States was a chosen country with enough room for our descendants to the hundredth and thousandth generation. Now, Jefferson was someone who was very precise about his wording. He was very precise about his use of language. Hundredth, thousandth generation. You know how long Jefferson considered a generation? 30 years. 30 years. The hundredth generation, 3,000 years. The thousandth generation, 30,000 years. So he's saying there'll be enough land here in North America for the hundredth and the thousandth generation. I think he kind of missed the boat on that one. Well, even in 1801, his was a country that was already being, being uh, limited in its growth. To the north, try this pointer thing again. To the north, should have brought my own pointer. Whoa, don't want to go there. Oh. To the north, there are those lakes, and there are British possessions north of that. That would limit American growth to the north. To the south, Spanish Florida, the Gulf of Mexico, that would temporarily limit American growth. To the west, there are Native Americans and there are Spaniards, Frenchmen. Well, there would be an opportunity there for the future. Now, when you talk about manifest destiny, one of the things that always comes up in this question about manifest destiny is that it was this preordained belief that Americans were destined to expand from the, from the east to the west and incorporate all those lands because Americans were going to do with that land what was right. What no one ever really says is that the only reason manifest destiny will work is because you have powerless neighbors, powerless neighbors who can't prevent you from expanding. So when you look at this map, as Jefferson saw it, to the north, Great Britain was a powerful neighbor. To the west, Native Americans, not so powerful. In fact, uh, you know, it's during Jefferson's presidency that Zebulon Pike goes out on an expedition out in the west, and he writes a report, and you remember what he calls that great area of the west? He calls it the Great American Desert. So with that powerless neighbor there, when it's time to remove them from the east, area east of the Mississippi River, move them to the west. Where do we put them? In the great American desert. And ultimately the Indians got the last laugh because they found oil in the early 20th century and they found casinos in the early 21st century. <laughs> but Jefferson understands that his vision of America, that it's going to have to have land. Now, shortly after the War of 1812, he's writing to an acquaintance called, uh, named John Jacob Astor. And he said that he looked forward with gratification to the time when the entirety of the Pacific Coast would be populated with free and independent Americans. He believed it would be so. Now, for Jefferson and his, his supporters, what they saw was the West and the abundance of land created the opportunity for this empire of liberty. Now, you look at these beliefs that Jefferson, that he uh, espoused. The acquisition of territory satisfy the energetic nature of our government. Gives people the chance, or yeoman farmer, the chance to purchase lands at minimal prices. You know, he said farmers are God's chosen people. Well, he truly believed that. And the revenues raised from those lands, well... You could sell those lands, you could make money, you could extinguish the debt. You wouldn't have to tax people as much. Land was a panacea for all evils. And as, his, as president, look what happens. During his first term, you'll have Ohio becoming the 17th state, joining 
Tennessee, Kentucky, and Vermont, and the original 13. Indiana in 1803 becomes a territory. And then in December of 1803, the United States would purchase Louisiana. In fact, it would be General James Wilkinson that would preside over the transfer of that territory. And in March of 1804, Captain Amos Stoddart would go to St. Louis and, uh, and preside over the transfer of that territory. Jefferson's empire of liberty was becoming a reality. Becoming a reality. Yet, is it enough land for the hundredth and thousandth generation? Jefferson still thinks so. We see that his secretary of war, uh, a secretary of war in the 1820s named James Barber would comment that there would be enough land for 500 years. Well, he didn't get it right either. In fact, we know that by 1890, the, the, uh, the frontier vanishes. So what Jefferson sees is that over the course of 100 years or so, Americans had crossed the Appalachian Mountains. They had moved down the Mississippi Valley. They had begun trickling into East and West Florida. America had secured the Louisiana Purchase, and now all eyes would focus to the West and to the South. Of course, that would be Texas. Now, while the, the acquisition of Louisiana does momentarily satisfy this desire for expansion, it was only a, a moment. In 1810, now, I know this is Texas history, so as I tell you this, I don't want you to be upset. I don't want to hear any hissing or booing. Um, in September of 1810, there's going to be a, a minor uprising, and of all places in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Now, let me tell you what happens here. There are a group of Americans who are living in this region, north of the Lake Pontchartrain and north of uh, New Orleans. They had been there for more than a decade, many of them had. The Spanish government was no longer able to meet their needs. And in September 1810, these Americans, they rise up, they storm the dilapida dilapidated fort there at Baton Rouge. In fact, there were there were gaps in the stockade that the men are running through. They capture the fort. They capture the governor. One Spanish soldier dies. Well, as soon as that conquest or that rebellion had been successful, they call a convention. They draft a declaration, which looks eerily similar to the American documents, their constitution, and then they even created a flag. They called it a bonnie blue flag with a single star in it. The original Lone Star Republic. See, that's where you fig I figured you guys would be hissing. Uh, but the reason I tell you about those little uprisings, when it's mentioned in history books, it's called the West Florida Rebellion. Now, rebellions generally imply they're not successful. Revolutions imply they are successful. Well, here you have a West Florida rebellion that is successful. And for about 90 days, this is the Republic of West Florida. President James Madison, in late October, will finally annex this region in the United States. And he doesn't do so as if he is annexing a a uh, independent country. He says, oh, God, no, this, is, this was part of the Louisiana Purchase. We're just now getting around to, to incorporating it. But what you have here in this West Florida Rebellion was exactly what Jefferson had mentioned, that Americans would move into a territory, they would profess loyalty to that government, and then when the opportunity presented itself, they would rise up, throw off the shackles of foreign control, and asked to be annexed into the Union. Well, what happens is 
this single star of the West Florida flag will be incorporated into the constellation of stars and stripes. Now, at the same time this event is going on, there's also, you probably, you may remember this guy here, Father Miguel Hidalgo. You know, in 1810, he lead, begins a revolution in Mexico. It's going to last for about a year and a half before he's finally executed. But at the same time that this is happening, you have what's going on in Baton Rouge. And shortly after that, there is a, a filibuster attempt that leaves the United States, leaves Natchitoches, Louisiana. It's led by a Tejano by the name of Jose, ben Jose Bernardo Maximilian Gutierrez de Lara. He's got the assistance of a Cuban revolutionary by the name of Don Jose Alvarez de Toledo de I Dubois. I wondered where he got the and Dubois part. And there's a former American Army officer named Augustus William McGee. They will set off from, from Natchitoches, cross through the neutral territory into Texas, beginning in the summer of 1812. When they finally arrive at Nacogdoches, the Spanish garrison there surrender. They join the filibuster. And then they begin moving to the south toward La Bahia. By the time they arrive there in August, they will siege that position for four months before the Spanish finally surrender. And then they will move to the north and west against San Antonio, even capturing San Antonio. Now, here is when the the Gutierrez Toledo McGee expedition begins to run awry. There are divisions, ethnic divisions within these ranks. And once they capture San Antonio, the Tejanos decide they're going to execute the Spanish governor, Manuel Salcedo. He will be executed, and many Americans say, you know, we didn't get involved in this to, to settle old scores. We got involved in this to bring Texas into the Union. Well, Americans begin leaving the rebellion. And within a few weeks, a Mexican force coming from the south will defeat the, the revolutionaries at the Battle of Medina, just outside of San Antonio. A young lieutenant that was on that expedition from Mexico is Antonio Lopez de Santana. It's his first taste of Texas. In the, the days after this expedition, there are others that will see Texas as a fertile ground just waiting to be taken. You may know of the famed privateer Jean Lafitte. Jean and his brother Pierre will join with a French privateer named Louis Ari. In 1817, they create a settlement in Galveston, and they're having a wonderful time plundering Spanish and Mexican and American ships. Until 1819, the American government says, that's enough's enough. They send a Navy expedition over. They hang about nine pirates, and it's amazing. You hang a few pirates, and that stopped it, <laughs> literally all at once. Well, at the same time Lafitte is there at Galveston, there's also a group of French Napoleonic officers who create a settlement at La Chance des Îles. What they envisioned is that they would liberate Napoleon from St. Helena and he would have this empire along the Gulf Coast. Well, Napoleon dies at St. Helena. And the empire, well, there's La Chance des Îles here. If you ever go out east into Alabama, there's a place called Demopolis which was founded by these French immigrants. That was to be the, the foundation of Napoleon's empire here in North America, and it doesn't play out. In the aftermath of the War of 1812, this borderland between Louisiana and Texas is a hotly contested area. 
And one of my favorite characters in all of American history, you know, it's not John Smith, uh, Arsène Le Carrière Latour. How many of you guys have heard of Latour? Oh, my wife has because she's lived with me for all these years. <laughs> Latour is one of these kind of enigmatic figures. He, he lived in the shadows of American history. He's a Frenchman, as you can tell by the name. He makes it to Louisiana in 1803. And he's an architect. He's an engineer. He had trained as a military engineer. Well, by the time of the War of 1812, he's having a hard time making ends meet. So he joins Andrew Jackson to fight in this War of 1812. And he, in fact, he is the, the person who designed the defenses for Jackson at Chalmette. Well, after the battle, Jackson dismisses the army by March of 1815. Latour is unemployed. He speaks French, he speaks Spanish, he speaks English. So he's actually going to be hired by the Spanish government to go on an expedition. He claims it's an expedition into the gold-producing regions of Arkansas. Yeah, you can actually find gold in Arkansas if you're lucky. So he and Jean Lafitte, they will go up into Arkansas, and for eight months they are out of sight. When he returns, being an architect engineer, he drafts a map. He writes a pretty lengthy report. And ultimately, he had visited the headwaters of the Red, the Sabine, the Trinidad, the Arkansas, the Colorado Rivers. He had made it all the way almost to, to uh, Santa Fe. And when he writes this report, he gives a copy to the Spanish government. It makes its way to the... the uh, the Captain General of Cuba, the Viceroy of Mexico, copies were sent to all the governors of the internal provinces. Man, this report is revealing. He says, and quote, the Americans aspire to supremacy over the future republics of the new world. Yes, they do. And this desire is founded on national interest rather than the liberality of ideas or the happiness of mankind. In other words, they want the territory for their own selfish means. And he says, the government works for this end, and the primary and first author of this plan was none other than Mr. Jefferson. Lure, Latour was convinced that if the Spanish don't put up a wall, they don't put up a wall, Americans are going to flood into Texas. In fact, he said that should Spain not do something, the time will come and unfortunately is not far off when the Americans will pour in myriads into Mexico. So they won't even go just to Texas, but they'll make it all the way to Mexico. And the reason, he says, because the Americans have strength of character. They have courage. They have skill in the use of guns. And their eyes are fixed on Texas and Mexico like the Jews on the promised land. <laughs> well, he insisted they would join any expedition like they had done with the Gutierrez Toledo McGee expedition. They would join any expedition even if it had little prospect of success because they had everything to gain and nothing to lose. Well... What Latour is telling them, you guys got to do something here. You know, Mex Americans are already gathering in Arkansas, and they're beginning to trickle over into Texas. It's only a matter of time. And, of course, those reports are read by the governors of the internal provinces of Mexico, and they say, well, tell us something new. Yeah, we know this. You got to give us more men. You got to give us more money. And until you do so, we can't build that wall there to keep them out. Well, Spanish don't give them the things they need. And in fact, John Quincy Adams in 1819 will negotiate this adams onis line that created a southwestern border to the Louisiana Purchase. Now, many Americans chastised Adams because he had given up Texas. 
He had sacrificed Texas. And by doing so, he got that toehold on the Pacific Northwest. By doing so, he made the United States a continental nation. And guess what? Adams had read Latour's report. He can give up. He can make some concessions there because it's just a matter of time before those Americans will find their way into Texas and take it for themselves. Well, you know, some of my distinguished fellow speakers will uh, tell you about how that really happens, but in a nutshell, Jefferson's vision is coming to reality here. And beginning in the early 1820s, come on up, there we go. <laughs> Stephen F. Austin, as you know, will begin leading settlers into Texas. Other impresarios will bring Americans into Texas. How quickly they, were they coming? Well, by 1824, there were roughly 2,000. By 1830, there were 20,000. By 1835, there were 35,000. Someone had turned the spigot on and forgot to turn it off. Just as Jefferson and Latour had prophesied. You know, Jefferson was hoping that 100,000, well, he was well on his way to getting that many people there. Well, of course, you guys know what happened next. <laughs> John Wayne, Richard Widmark, Lawrence Harvey. <laughs> Sorry, Steve, I prefer the original. <laughs> but in any case, <laughs> but in any case, what's happening here is that it's exactly as had happened in the West Florida Rebellion. Americans moved into Texas. They had not been completely happy with the situation in Texas, so they began asking for concessions to reorganize the government so that it is a separate state rather than part of Coahuila. Well, at the time, they didn't realize that Mexico had its own internal problems. There's a struggle between the centralist and the federalist, and Amer the, the Americans in Texas just get caught in that struggle. Well, of course, the Texas Revolution, you notice it is a revolution. It was not the Texas Rebellion. So it was successful, the Texas Revolution. And Texas becomes a free and independent state. President uh, Andrew Jackson wanted to annex Texas. Can't do so because of the slavery question. He does recognize it as a republic on his last day in office. His successor, Martin Van Buren, won't touch the Texas question because of the slavery issue. It's not until the election of 1844 that James Knox Polk will make the annexation of Texas a political issue. And as he is being elected in the fall of 1844, John Tyler will actually be responsible for the annexation of Texas itself. He had tried to annex Texas under a, joint, I mean under a, a treaty Treaty needed two-thirds of both houses. Well, a joint resolution simply needs a, a, a majority. I said two-thirds of both houses, pardon me, two-thirds of the Senate. A, a joint resolution needs a simple majority in each house. So by December of 1845, December 29, 1845, Texas would become the 28th state. And this 28-star flag would be a, a valuable flag. It remains in existence for only one year before Iowa become the, became the 29th state in December of 1846. Now, two days, two days before the official entrance of Texas into the Union, John Lewis O'Sullivan, newspaper, the U.S. Magazine and Democratic Review, ran an editorial in which he said, the right of our manifest destiny to overspread and possess the whole of the continent, which providence has given us for the development of this great experiment of liberty and federative development of self-government entrusted to us. It is right such as that of the tree to the space of air and the earth suitable for the full expansion and principle of destiny and growth. This is manifest destiny. 
And although it's 20 years after Jefferson's death, Jefferson's vision, Jefferson's vision has become a reality. And in the years that followed, the Southwest, the Pacific Coast, the Pacific Northwest, just like Jefferson had prophesied. So this idea of manifest destiny and Jefferson's empire of liberty, they're synonymous. They're connected by the dream that Americans wanted to possess this land and would take any opportunity short of war to do so. Within a few years, the stars and stripes will fly from the Atlantic to the Pacific, just as Jefferson had predicted. Thank you so much. Questions, questions? <laughs>